bring. Uh, first of all, can I congratulate you on your uh, efforts at turning your life around? Was it hard? It happened. How it happened, a bit of a mystery to me. Mm. Obviously, I worked hard at the things I tried to work hard at, whether it's theology degree or writing books. Um, but whatever it was, um, I don't sort of feel I was deserve any great accolade. It worked out wonderfully well, and it's a bit of a mystery. Of course, I think God was in it somewhere, but um, whatever it was, um, it's certainly been a good roller coaster ride. It is, but my heart goes out to you. I, I know that w the reason that you wound up in jail was, was self-inflicted. I know you, you regret that. You've reflected on it. You've atoned for it. And hey, you've served your time, paid your debt to society. Can you remember your first night in Clink? Oh, you bet I can. Um, it was pretty frightening. Um, you go through all the usual grisly rituals of being put in handcuffs, led off to uh, a sweat box or uh, the lorries which carry prisoners into jail. In my case, I was taken to Belmarsh, uh, Britain's highest security prison. But the only really frightening bit came sort of late at night when um, my left and right cell neighbours broadcast to the rest of the prison that I'd arrived in such and such a cell. And suddenly a chant started, um, even on your distinguished television, so I'd better not repeat the fruity details of the chant. But the gist of it was, that expletive deletive Aitken has now arrived in cell 312B and HB3. Tomorrow morning, lads, let's show him. And then they followed the most dramatic anatomical descriptions of all the things they'd like to do uh, to the body of a Tory cabinet minister when they met him. And I make light of it now, but actually I was pretty scared at the time. But you won't have slept much that night. Uh, did your relationship with your co-prisoners change over time? It did. It got better and better. Mm. But I had a great slice of luck at the beginning. Um, about my third day, a young prisoner asked me to help him write a letter trying to stave off being evicted from his council flat in South Lambeth because he couldn't write himself. It's a big problem in literacy in the prison. Anyway, I wrote him a letter of appeal, and he thanked me for it very nicely. And then instead of putting it in the post box or just keeping his pocket, he did something rather unusual. He turned himself into a sort of 18th century town crier, and he went down the wing holding this letter aloft, shouting, Hey, guys, this MP geezer of ours... He's got fantastic joined-up writing. <laughs> wonderful. No. So it's just kept as this uh, wonderful ornament rather than... Well, no, I think, he, I think he used it in the end. But <laughs> the point was, from that moment onwards, every night of my prison sentence, a queue used to form of people wanting letters read to them and written for them, often on the most intimate subjects imaginable. And this was um, very good for me because, A, it changed my status from being that hated Tory cabinet minister, being, oh, this guy, you know, help me with my letters. But much more than that, it taught me an awful lot about prisoners I just didn't know that subculture well. And I wouldn't be a prison chaplain now if I hadn't formed a certain affinity to those who've made a mess up their lives well, and gone to prison. as I mentioned in the introduction, you have voluntarily gone back to prison, really, yes. haven't you? Did, did, yeah. did you have to think twice before doing that? Because normally when people get out, they like to stay out. Um, I was always keen to do something because so few people have this experience of going to mm. prison and then having a chance to work in it. Um, becoming a prison chaplain sort of happened by accident. In my world, you pray and you get calls. But actually, what really got me going was reading a little verse of doggerel by a man who'd been um, the captain of the English cricket team. He was as famous as Ben Stokes is today, except I'm talking about 1883. And this was a guy whose name was Stud, C.T. Stud. And he became a priest. And everyone said, oh, you know, a wonderful cricket captain of England is going to be a priest. He'll be a bishop in no time in Victorian days. And he said, no, 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 I want to be a prison chaplain. And everyone said, well, don't do that. I mean, they never get promoted to bishops. And he said, no, I insist on doing it. And they said, why? And he wrote a little verse of doggerel, and it went as follows. Some like to live within the sound of church and chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. And when I read that, I said, I'd love to do that. And that's what I really, I love being a prison chaplain. It's tough work. But it's really, really interesting and fulfilling. You can empathise with them and they can trust you and you have credibility because you've been a prisoner yourself. That's true, I think. I mean, they're very surprised when, in my posh voice, I say I was a prisoner. 
and the spirit becomes clear in a few then moments. you can say look i was i was one of you yeah i was in belmarsh i know um the beirut wing or whatever it is yeah so i know the jargon i'm really really sorry at the news that you lost your wife some Thank months you. ago and uh, my heart goes out to you and your family and uh, condolences very very sad um sad sad thing to happen um what about the your relations with your family following your time in jail because the court case was was a disaster you um you sued the uh, the guardian the case collapsed uh, you committed perjury uh, and that will have been you know devastating for your career your finances but also your family life so have you managed to piece that back together yes i mean it, there was a bumpy ride of mm. course i let my family down very very badly and their lives were shaken and shattered because of that on the other hand the bonds are strong um and sons and daughters love their fathers right and wrong sometimes uh, and so they always came and visited me regularly in jail the, the bonds were never broken they were strained uh, and um, family life has gone on being good i um, mean i was had lunch today with two of my daughters who came to hear me preach a sermon and um i'm also on very good terms with the um sons of my uh, wife elizabeth uh she was an interesting wonderful woman uh, she was married before me to two movie stars she was mrs rex harrison and mrs richard harris well i think you were I'm, the most I'm, handsome I'm, of the three let no, me tell I'm, you. I'm the most boring of the three <laughs> <laughs> uh well look you also have been in the upper echelons of politics and you were chief secretary to the treasury so you'll have been fascinated by this mm. week's budget because uh, the chief secretary that's a very important role uh, isn't it uh, sort of number 2 to the chancellor i suppose and the chief secretary's got to crunch the numbers do you think this mini budget adds up jonathan I think it will but it's a gamble that's fair enough um but it's a gamble I think in the right direction because without it there was a sort of inevitable slide downwards into a recession and getting worse uh these guys have softened the recession number one secondly they've been very brave i mean the greatest prizes in politics goes to people who have clear vision and the courage to implement it Margaret Thatcher Margaret Thatcher certainly but others I mean Churchill actually is not Tony Thatcher but uh, I think it's brave strategy um and will it work well no one can be sure but I think it's worth betting on it and um, what is your gut instinct about Liz Truss you served under Margaret Thatcher you entered the House of Commons in 74 yes she became leader a year later yes so she was you know certainly so she was a uh, your prime minister and your leader for over 15 years so is she margaret thatcher mark 2 what are your feelings about truss i think she's margaret thatcher mark 2 in one or two areas she's courageous mm. she's decisive um she works very very hard at the detail um whether she's got that she hasn't got the same command of the language uh, and the house of commons yet um but she's looking promising Uh, and prime ministers grow in office in extraordinary ways um i i must confess that i wasn't a liz trust supporter at first not that i'm in politics and all, mm. of course but um you, did you have a vote actually strange enough still am almost by mistake a member of the conservative party somehow or other my ballot paper never reached me but if i had had it i probably wouldn't have used it to trust but anyway watching her now i'm increasingly optimistic that uh, she may be able to pull it off and succeed and of course she's very controversial and she's got massive opposition so did thatcher i think your story is a very inspiring and humbling one i i i know that you acted in such an improper way and you made a colossal mistake but i think that you've probably suffered you know the most really from from that um it's amazing how you've come through that uh, you're a man of faith you're now an anglican priest a prison chaplain and one of the important themes of christianity is forgiveness so have you forgiven yourself Yes, but it's not actually my business to go forgive myself. If you have a Christian faith, at the heart of the Christian faith is that God forgives those who truly repent, who really are genuinely sorry. If he's forgiven you, it's not for me to say I can forgive myself, I can't forgive myself. He's the decision maker, and I think he has forgiven me. Who plays you in Jonathan Ake in the movie? <laughs> Clooney? I've never thought of this. I think you're you're far too humble to answer that question. 